Welcome to this webinar, Lessons Learned for Major Projects in the Use of Technology for Construction Excellence, which is part of our three-day programme on digital construction. I'm Thomas Lane, the group editor of Building Magazine. Technology is an essential component for successful project delivery and is becoming even more critical thanks to the greater adoption of modern methods of construction and the need to deliver net zero buildings. This webinar is set to share lessons learned from major projects that have harnessed cutting edge technologies to achieve high levels of success. In this webinar, we will explore the role of technology in design, projects that utilize modern methods of construction and the importance of effective collaboration. We will also cover how to embed new ways of working as technology is of limited effectiveness without good change management and culture change too. To discuss this, I'm joined by three experts. Amy Casterton, the Business Development Director of ES Global, who specializes in designing and delivering relocatable buildings. Paul Drayton, the Head of Digital at Contractor at Langer Rock, and Dale Sinclair, the Director of Head of Digital Innovation at the consultant WSP. So welcome to our panelists. Um, the format of today is each panelist will speak up to about 10 minutes of a presentation. And once these are over, we will in, start a panel discussion and take your questions. So please do submit your questions either during the presentations or um, once the presentations are over. So in terms of what we're going to be covering specifically, Amy will explain the ES global modular system and the role of digital tools for fast project delivery. Paul will talk about the role of digital for project delivery at Langer Rock and the change, man change management that is needed to make that successful. And Dale will talk about the difference for design between traditional and modern methods of construction, the tools and the culture change that needs to accompany that. So we're, the running order will be Amy, Paul and Dale. And I would like to hand over Amy for our first presentation. Thank you, Amy. Thanks, Thomas. Just doing my unmuting now. I'm just going to share my screen. Here we go. Super. Hopefully everyone can see that. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today and I'm going to give a bit of a main contractor's perspective um, about how we are servicing major projects um, using our DFMA systems but increasingly using digital tools to um, enhance that design process and also the end user journey for those buildings. And we see huge potential for digital platforms to really revolutionize how we are delivering our structures. Uh, just a bit of a start about how we got into DFMA and MMC. ES Global is a specialist in um, experience venues. So we are well known in the world of the Olympics. Uh, we built the London 2012 water polo and shooting venues, for example. But actually, our story goes, our kind of DFMA story goes way back. Um, over 50 years ago, we started a staging and logistics company. So this is one of our stage builds in process last year. And um, we actually did the uh, Live Aid stage back in 1985 in Wembley as well. And our, our systems have obviously evolved since then. But essentially, we are creating steel truss systems which flap back and pin together. So that logistical efficiency and the reuse of our structures, really kind of embedding the circular economy in all of our approaches is really important. Um, this is a, one of our stages in action last year. This is Harry Styles' European tour. For any of you who happen to see it, uh, that's one of our big roofs. And we've got 11 systems touring uh, Europe this summer. But what we've been able to do from those staging trust systems is to develop um, super trust systems, building superstructures. And this is a velodrome in Jakarta that we built for the 2018 uh, Asian Games. 
And it really shows our kit of parts achieving those wide span trust structures. And it's really when we started developing enhanced digital journeys, particularly in the design phase, as we're designing this kit of parts using our CAD teams, this project was done with Mott McDonald engineers out of Indonesia and also Cox architects um, based out of Australia. So we were working as that collaborative team to design the kit of parts to produce this permanent velodrome um, in Jakarta. The structure which actually was actually made from legacy trust systems from the London 2012 Olympics. Um, this summer, we are official suppliers to the Paris Olympics, uh, including building the climbing wall. Um, so that Olympic journey is really important for us. And another project I wanted to take um, you through was a current venue of ours, which is the Abba Voyage um, Arena in East London. This is part of that major project journey of the Olympics in East London for us as a company. Our old um, yard and test build centre was actually on the Olympic Park and we were compulsory purchase, purchased off there as one of those original um, companies that were on Bell Lane, for any of you who know the Olympics project. And London 2012 continues to have really big echoes for us. This is an incredibly digitally advanced venue. For those of you who've seen the show, um, it's a 270 degree immersive experience. It's the world's largest amountable venue. Um, and it has a 744 tonne, I think, floating roof, which we lifted in one movement with uh, 18 strand jacks. But this um, system is also fully flat packable. So it's designed to fit as efficiently as possible into containers. So that digital journey, working with Stewfish art architects, Atelier One and Momentum Engineers, we had to design that system to the nth degree because as you can see, it's also foundationless. Um, and it works as well as any permanent theatre venue uh, in London. That hybrid steel frame um, can be transported anywhere in the world. And it's really kind of also an example of a really agile venue because that lease continues to be um, extended in London as the show continues to tell, sell tickets. But at, at the a moment in time, that venue will be moved and LLDC, uh, the landowners, have allocated that land for future development. So it's a really good example of meanwhile use projects uh, in action. Taking you now through one of our, one of our really important developments where we see kind of modular construction going as a main contractor and where we see huge opportunity for digital innovation um, is our modular system that we that we've developed and this is actually the UK pavilion for the World Expo in Japan um, that is going into fabrication now and will go into construction later this year in Osaka. Um, and this has to be compliant with permanent building codes because it's Japan and it has to be seismic and typhoon compliant. But probably as interesting as where that product has developed from, this was a project we led as a principal contractor during the pandemic. It was the Dragon's Heart COVID hospital in Cardiff in the Principality Stadium. Um, and we, we had to deliver this in an incredibly fast track manner. Um, luckily, we had a supply chain that was suddenly redundant. COVID hit. This was kind of early April 2020. And all of the events were also cancelled. So we were able to mobilise our very trusted event supply chain. But more importantly, we were able to deliver um, hospital compliant beds within a week in Cardiff and we had various challenges which we had to work through in collaboration with our partners, um, including getting all the services uh, to the tents um, in a pitch, which is obviously on a pitch, which isn't used to having services. But where we come to kind of future design innovation is that this is a fast track COVID response, but is that appropriate in normal times when there might be that fast track need, but actually is that the best use of, of public money? And what we've done is gone away and thought about this in a bit more depth 
and thought about where could you, how could you create more agile services where the, um, the integrated systems, including the MEP, are working. So you can build a facility in a month, but actually you can relocate that. And really crucially, you can reconfigure it. And this is where um, I can show the test build for what we're doing for the UK Pavilion on our yard in the East Midlands. And we're putting that system together. We're designing it so it can be foundationless so that it can take panel, is panelized and taking panels that exist in the existing supply chain. And really it's a, it's a platform approach, which means that we're working on the user experience. And this is an immersive venue alongside the client as we design and fabricate that system. And you can see it coming together here. What this means is that with digital platforms, we can create a venue, a building, a structure, which can create a user need, but also can be reconfigured internally and externally in time. So that's kind of where we see the digital innovation going in the MMC sector. Obviously we're specialists in relocatable buildings, but equally permanent buildings that can have a future lifespan um, that's perhaps undefined by the end users at the moment. Um, but can be revisited and those materials can be reused and, and done in a much more um, sustainable way. So there's some reflections on kind of what we do as a company, where we see digital innovation going. Um, yeah, I'm really happy to take some questions at the end. Thank you. Great. Well, um, thanks very much, Amy. Um, a quick question just before we move on to our next presenter. Um, I mean, I can see you've got a platform approach, you've got this kit of parts, but I mean, I guess sometimes you need to have a specific services solution for a particular building, which might be different from for the same building elsewhere. I mean, how adaptable is the system to accommodate a specific servicing requirement and, and how does digital facilitate that? Yeah, no, that's a really that's a really good question. If we take a kind of healthcare facility, we've actually designed that with a significant cavity in the roof so that we can run all the services through that. Um, but really importantly, with programs like Hospital 2.0, where digital innovation in the UK, where digital innovation is kind of how do you create that increasingly digital hospital facility? We've designed that so you can get back into the roof at any point to update it. And that's what we've kind of we see as the challenge with modular buildings that you're sometimes you are creating volumetric prefabricated facilities that are almost a bit of a race to the bottom. You've commissioned them and they can do that thing, but then they will gradually be kind of reaching their end life rapidly once that first use hasn't, you know, has has taken place. What we want to do is design systems and agility in the building so that you can get back in and update it and that feels really important so that volume volumetric modular systems can be renovated and can be updated so the healthcare facility we purposely kind of over and engineered space into the system so that we can keep we can digitally update it as well great thank you that's really interesting Amy, because I know, as, as you say it's quite an issue with modular um, buildings that once they need refurbishing you almost got to start again so it's very encouraging to hear the work that you're doing in that area um so i'm going to hand over to our next speaker paul from langer rock so thank you paul no problem i'll just share the screen there a second great Thomas, hopefully you can see that okay. Yeah, that's great, yes. Um, you've got yeah. that, that's perfect, thank you. Okay, look, uh, thanks very much for the opportunity to, to share some thoughts today. My name is Paul Drayton, I'm the, I'm the head of digital uh, uh, here at Lang O'Rourke. Uh, and I'm gonna try and try and cover three uh, three things today. The first is why. Why are we, um, why does this matter? Why are we interested in the role that technology can, can play within the built environment? Um, secondly, what are some of the solutions uh, that, that we're using um, on, our, on our major projects today that are really helping um, make a difference. Uh, and then the final bit, but perhaps the most important bit is, is the how. How do we make sure that all of these great technological innovations 
um, actually stick on our projects and, and, and have the impact that we that we know they can. Um, I'm going to start with uh, with a number, and, and this picture in the background is Hinkley Point C down in Somerset, uh, one of the biggest um, construction projects underway in, in the west of Europe at the moment. Uh, and the number is 585,000. 585,000 hours of, of work uh, are done at Hinkley Point every fortnight. Um, that's huge. Yeah, that, that, that is a lifetime of labor. 67 uh, people years of, of, of labor are done every 14 days down at Hinkley. So if ever there was a, there was a real burning, you know, burning desire to do things um, you know, for technology to make a difference, you know, th these are the sorts of mega projects uh, where, where this is absolutely the case. Now, there's some great work going on down at, at, at Hinkley from a, from, a, from a technology and innovation perspective, from a data and a digital perspective. But there's more that we can and there's more that we want to be to be doing in here. You know, there, there is still a lot of physical manual uh, labor uh, going into these projects. There's still manual data capture going on. Um, there's still a bit of a prevalence of drawings. You know, not everything is in is in is in the model. Um, Going forward, this isn't going to be this isn't going to be sustainable. You know, a combination of changing demographics, people aren't going to be want to be doing you know huge volumes of steel fixing in five, 10, 20 years time. Um, plus, great innovations in technology. Plus, you know, ever ever tightening requirements from a from a sustainability perspective um, means that it means that as an, yeah, as, as an industry, we're, we're going to have to have to change, and that presents a huge opportunity for uh, for, for you know for technology to play its part. So in terms of you know what are what are the benefits that technology can provide? I think this is a big part of the of the case for change. You know what do, what do we see our clients wanting? And indeed, what do we want as a contractor? We want to we want delivery certainty. So we want to do what we said we were going to do when we said we were going to do it, and you know at the at, at the agreed and contracted cost. So you know our incentives are aligned with our clients, which is good. But actually, there's so much more that technology. Um, can actually enable and, and, and provide uh, provide to us here. So we can engineer in safety from the outset. Um, we can make construction more attractive and more inclusive through through greater automation and actually digitization, attracting new talent into the into the sector. We can improve um, sustainability. As I said, you know this is this is something that's a, that's a key driver across all of our all of our sectors. Uh, and actually, we can reduce the carbon footprint of designs. Uh, of our processes and even of our plant you know we've got some 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 full electric plant out on our, on our sites now which are uh, which are performing really well and also we can drive engagement with projects we can raise the awareness and the understanding of of a scheme and what it's going to offer to the uh, you know to the local area um and that's something that is great for for clients for wider stakeholders and even for for for, for, for our colleagues out uh, delivering these projects so I'd like to I'd like to step through some examples now, and I'm I'm going to wind the clock back. Um, doing things differently and embracing technology in different ways of working has has kind of been at the core of Lang O'Rourke's DNA since the beginning. And and this 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 graphic here is back in 1987. This is uh, Broadgate, uh, one of one of our our first big projects in in London, and the ambitious developer let a let a package of work and had allocated 56 weeks to do that. Um, Ray tended for it and said that said that we could do it in 24 weeks. And the developer came back and said, "No, you, it's, it's just not possible. Uh, you can't understand the you know the the scope of the work and what's and what's required." Um, but Ray responded and said, um, "You haven't heard how we're gonna how we're gonna do it." Um, and by applying innovative technology, innovative working to, uh, to 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 both save time and reduce waste, Langer won this work. Um, but they actually beat that 24 week target as well. They handed this over after after just just 20 weeks. Um, and really that that kind of thinking differently and pushing the boundaries of what's possible in in service of in service of humanity and of the construction sector has been the absolute backbone of of, of Langer Rock's offering. If we then roll the clock forward some 30 years um, to a hospital down in in South Wales. So this is this is the Grange. This has got 560 beds, state of the art. Uh, and, and there was really a burning need um, for the NHS to, to take over this hospital um, in response to, to, to the COVID pandemic. So building on, on what Amy was, um, uh, was talking about earlier on. Um, by applying best practice um, uh, construction methods and, uh, and using our, the experience that we've accrued over the last 30 years, 
by using smart digital technology and really harnessing the power of data and also going for a modular build that's become you know a core part of, of every Langer Walk project. Um, this was able to be done in something like three years rather than the four that the, that the healthcare um, uh, that the healthcare client uh, required. Um, it was delivered early and it was handed over with with zero defects. That, that last point that I made around around offsite manufacture, design for manufacture and assembly, um, is a core part of Langer Walk's offering. And we we target a minimum of seventy percent offsite manufacturing in uh, uh, in our factories for every one of our projects. We're very fortunate to have uh, to have a factory that that can provide um, uh, MEP modules, but we've also got um, our, our factory uh, up in Worksop, um, CEMC, uh, uh, Centre of Excellence for, for Modern Construction. And as you can see from this this video that's hopefully playing from your end, we've got automated and flexible production lines there um, that are producing modular units in in a safe, warm, dry uh, environment where we've truly managed to get that CAD to CAM linkage working, where we can link the model and, and, and really de be deploying that down to the, down to the systems, which gives us great control over the, over the quality and the timing of our, of our, of our components. Um, now we use this for our, for our walls and our floors, but we're increasingly using it for our, for our facade panels as well. So, so embedding uh, block work and uh, you know, bricks and, and stone, uh, stone panels within here. And these modules are then loaded onto the back of a wagon and transported down to down to site, uh, really pulling on kind of just in time methodologies from uh, from the automotive sector. Um, the great thing here is that when when the modules are loaded onto the wagon, and they leave the factory um, that's signaled down to the project site. They know exactly what's coming. They even know the order that it's loaded onto the machine so they can prepare themselves if they need to you know, need to lay any any items down. And these, you know, we're lifting components, uh, precast components off of the um, off of the wagons and dropping them straight into situ. Um, so, you know, it's a it's a great safe way of working, um, but also the you know, the pace uh, that, that, that the units then go up is is absolutely incredible, incredible to see. Uh, hopefully, as you can see on here, you know, it starts to it's, it really starts to go together like a Meccano set. And it's, it's much more like an assembly line um, than it is um, a construction site. Um, so that's something that we feel is, you know, is, is going to be key to making construction a much more inclusive and attractive uh, sector sector going forwards. So another great example uh, where some of these some of these technological innovations uh, are showing up is the uh, Everton Stadium, which which both uses some of the modern methods of construction and a lot of offsite, um, but also is, has really been pushing the boundaries of, of, of the role that digital can play in uh, in, in project delivery. Uh, it really exemplifies um, our our built twice approach, where we get to that construction level of detail uh, in in the model um, before we then go through and actually and actually build it on site. The advantage there is that you know some weeks and months ahead of time we can start ironing out issues of alignments or conflicts, clashes, etc., um, which is which is ever more important when you're doing a lot of work uh, off site because you need to bring them to site and, and, and be bolting things together without without any issues. And then you can start building on this. Um, you can start building on this uh, uh, this level of detail in the model um, by linking it into the schedule. So uh, what's what's showing in the background here is then the four D um, uh, the four D uh, governance that we've got in place on a weekly basis here at Everton, where we understand not just what's going in but when it's going in, um, and that's that's absolutely vital for us to be able to plan our, our logistics and our, our movements around site, even crane operations site access and egress, uh, et cetera. And then again, building on that to the next level of detail, um, once you know what you're gonna build in the model and when you're gonna build it from the schedule, you can also start to evaluate, how am I gonna build this? So we're starting getting, uh, really focusing on, you know, on the safety and the comfort of our, of, our, of our teams by understanding how am I gonna fit these components in a safe and effective, and effective way? So the roof here is, is particularly complex, you know, complex geometry, it's, it's a long way off the ground and it's on the side of the Mersey. So it's, it's generally pretty wet and windy um, and being able to go in there and, and actually and actually, you know, scenario test. Can I physically access this thing here? And, you know, the images at the bottom around the operator, can they get in there to actually affix these components or do they need two left arms that are eight feet long? So it's, it's, it's never going to it's never going to be possible. 
Something that's really neat is that is that our technology journey is very much iterative, where every project is trying to trying to build on the successes and the lessons of, of, of the past. So we're kind of climbing that technology staircase on, on, on every project we go to. Um, so I'll just wrap up with um, uh, with an example of the uh, from the Stephen A. Schwartzman Center for the Humanities down at Oxford University. You know, beautiful building, very in keeping uh, with the with the surrounding architecture down there in, in the center of Oxford. Um, and all of this has come together through, you know, through a, a high level of detail in the in the model and then all of the offsite manufacturing for the for the walls and the floors and indeed the facade panels. And you can see the gaps in here, which you know, show where the edges of the facade panels are and they're going to be stitched in uh, and tied in to complete the um, to complete the facades. And this whole building, the facade's going up in, in just a small handful of weeks. So the pace is absolutely incredible that this technology that can, can enable. Um, something else that's really been embraced down here by, by all the stakeholders has been um, how you visualize them, uh, visualize the model and, and, and interact with it. Um, and, and this is uh, over on the right hand side is Stephen A. Schwartzman. So Stephen is, uh, sorry, Mr. Schwartzman is the investor. He's um, he's really interested to understand right from a brownfield level. You know, what am I going to see? What am I going to be? What am I going to be getting for my investment here? Um, and and we use that a lot when we're when we're when we're um, inviting stakeholders from the university and from uh, from other institutions uh, onto the site. But also, this is some of the work that our coordinators are using out on sites. Uh, you can see the video playing out there, where we understand what are some of the services and uh, and MEP modules that are going to be coming in. So people can make sure that they're not, you know, they're not laying down equipment in the wrong area. They're able to deconflict, deconflict trades, uh, and, and 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 so on. Look, I could I could talk all afternoon about some, you know, e even more great examples of where technology is making a difference. But none of these um, are much use if they if they don't actually if they don't actually stick. Um, so I'd like to I'd like to end with the how. How do we make sure that the technologies that we're embedding are, are going to truly de deliver the value that we that we know they can? Um, there's a lot to consider here. Um, we, Tom, you talked about change management earlier, and, and what I've tried to do is distill down um, you know, years of ch change management methodology into into five key lessons. I think the first one is that the most important thing about getting technology to stick in in any industry, but construction. Uh, is is the people we have to make sure that we tap into the into the hearts and minds of the people bring them along with us um uh, and anticipate that there's going to be nervousness there's going to be um you know potentially objection so we need to plan for that and actively actively manage it uh, and, and and flex our approach one way to really bring people on mind is to is to demonstrate how it's actually going to make their lives easier is it going to make things safer is it going to remove a you know a frustration uh, is it going to give someone an opportunity to to learn and grow and expand uh, and expand their skill set? Um, and once you've once you once you've sold people the dream, let's go and actually measure measure the impact that this new technology is happening. We all know that that that, that saying around what gets measured gets done, um, and it's really important to to sense check: is this technology having the impact that I thought it was going to? If it is, great. Let's celebrate it. Let's think about how we can how we can get even more out of it and use it wider. If it's not, it gives us an early warning, so we can go through and we can course correct and think a little bit differently about how do we get the how do we get the right impact. Now. Something that's key as well is is getting the ownership right. So you cannot do technology to a business uh, to to a team. It has to be done. It has to be done by that team. That's absolutely vital that they own it and drive it. Otherwise, it simply won't simply won't stick. Um, and then and then to that point. Um, Prioritization is absolutely vital. You know, too often we have uh, our eyes are bigger than our bellies, and, and and we get a little bit over enthusiastic, and we try to we try to do too many things on a project. I'd offer that if we just pick a couple of high priority items and do them really really well, get them to stick, and then move on to the next thing, will yield much better buy-in and much better results than trying to spin too many too many plates. Okay, so just to just to wrap up, hopefully uh, you feel I've covered I've covered those three things today. The why um, we need to change to be ready to be the, the workplace of the future, and, and technology's got a huge role to play in that. The what there's lots of great examples out there that are, that are having uh, that are having an impact, and actually, you know, a lot of these examples are, are, are taking inspiration from other sectors outside of construction, including 
you know, automotive, aerospace, defense, and, and, and further afield. And then finally, but, but perhaps most important takeaway for me is we, we talked about how we can make these technologies as sticky as possible so they can deliver the impact that we know they can. Look, I hope that's been uh, useful and I'm very happy to answer any questions that you might have uh, later on in the session. Thanks very much. Great. Um, thanks very much indeed, Paul. Um, quick question for you before we move on. Um, it's really interesting to sort of see how you're sort of uh, developing your factory processes. You can now do facades um, as well as doing um, precast concrete panels and the digital technology that underpins that. How applicable is that to a project like Hinkley Point C, which is highly bespoke? Yeah, it's a good question. I th I, and I think I'd cast that question kind of wider across the sector as well. It's, it's a question of appetite for me. Um, most people want want their unique building, their unique their, their unique product, and that that may not change quickly. Um, so so having something that is configurable is is, is I think you know configurable and flexible is really important. I guess you know the other end of the scale is getting to to a modular solution, and and, and that is something that we are that we are playing with in a couple of sectors. We've got a great kind of modular modular bridge um, offering. Mm -hmm. um, but that does that does drive you down, you know, to get real maximum value from that. It does drive you down a um, a configuration, uh, you know, a, a modular configuration setup. So so I, I think the you know first and foremost these things need to be configurable and flexible, and then it's a question of uh, of appetite. We can probably get you know faster schedules, lower costs, lower waste, um, but that will be at the expense of of kind of the uniqueness of products as you talk about. So. I think yeah, it, it's configurable, so it does lend itself to to a range of different uh, applications. Great, well, thank you very much, Paul. Um, so I'm going to hand over to our last presenter, Dale. Um, so thank you very much, Dale. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, so just. You can see my screen okay? Yeah. That's great, yeah. yeah. Okay, brilliant. So uh, I want to start today, Thomas, I mean, uh, by really stating that technology and construction are, are not actually new. Uh, and uh, the importance of going back 500 years is quite crucial because, and, and I love this book by Brian Arthur, because it talks about how uh, innovation is really driven by two, two or more ideas coming together. And I'm going to come back to that point. But uh, um, Dale, Dale yeah. so, so to interrupt, could you just hide that little bar on your presentation? Oh, ah, yes. Um, sort of spoiling the presentation, just, yeah. just click on hide. It'll go yeah, away. thanks. Yeah, it's, it's annoying me as well. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so 500 years ago, uh, a bunch of Florentine architects decided that being the master builder uh, was no longer the best way to design buildings, and they disintermediated uh, design and construction. Now, the important uh, innovation at that point in time was the scale drawing. Now, I'll, I'll come back to why that's really, really important, because the scale drawing to this day, and Paul's picked up on this, we still focus a lot on drawing. So I think a lot of the paradigms of the past are still really relevant today and are really difficult to shift in our industry. And the, the other reason I want to talk about paradigm shifts is I do genuinely believe by the end of this decade uh, that we will see a paradigm shift in the way that we make buildings. Now, the second paradigm shift I want to talk about that's really been crucial for the uh, industry was around the middle of 1850 to say 1880, where things like lighting systems were invented, Otis invented the lift, we invented toilets, because before then we used to go into the garden uh, to do the business. And of course, the Bessemer process was invented. And arguably that uh, layer of innovation uh, resulted in things like the Empire State Building, which is still a really innovative building that was built incredibly fast for 100 years ago. Now, coming to today, and this is a point that we've spoken about, we, we certainly see the design of buildings becoming more complex as we as we uh, have the big push to decarbonize our buildings, whether that's embodied or operational carbon. And, and I love this diagram from McKinsey that really sets out that increasing complexity and the extent to which uh, innovation and technology will be important in the buildings that we do. Uh, and as I've said, the, the whole push is really trying to take the carbon out of our projects, which I don't think we've spoken to today. And 
in particular shifting to circular economy principles. And the reason circular economy principles are important is we see a huge shift away from the single project into programs of work. And more importantly, uh, we've been designing buildings as, as I've really just set out for a long time, for hundreds of years. Uh, but we, we're certainly working with a number of clients to look at how we design buildings more like products by the end of the this century. Now, that's not a straightforward uh, shift from designing for construction into design for manufacturing. There's a whole layer of topics that we need to address. We need to design for manufacturing and assembly, which is very, very different to designing for construction. Uh, we need new products. So some of the large products that we are designing just now, we're having to create the supply chain for these. Uh, we're working with some clients to look at factory infrastructure at a country level. Uh, and of course, as we move jobs from the construction site into the factories, we can actually use these to position social value propositions. And of course, with some of our clients, uh, we're seeing, and Paul's just picked up that whole point about customization, we're, we're seeing our customers' customers being really important and uh, our customers wanting the ability for their customers to customize projects as they go through. And that's particularly prevalent in the residential sector. And, and when we come on to MMC itself, we're, we're still obviously grasping with this change into lots of different systems. Uh, we're looking at volumetric systems, we're looking at panelized systems, we're working with structural platforms. And in some locations, we're having to use all of these to look at the, the delivering uh, MMC and offsite content at scale, because obviously transition from uh, construction to offsite manufacturing is not an overnight task. Uh, we, we calculated that if you take 30% of the UK construction output, you become br bigger than British aerospace. And, and obviously that industry didn't happen overnight. Now, in terms of what we're doing, it was quite interesting to hear Amy talking about kits of parts. We, we've been working on kit of part projects for the last two years, and we, we've now approaching uh, more than a dozen projects that we've delivered using kit, kit of parts. Now, what kit of parts starts to do is to allow us to start the design process with a catalog of components in mind. So back to that point, I was making that shift away from working on the individual project and trying to create content that's reusable across multiple projects. And from that uh, proof of concept that we worked on, we're actually delivering our first kit of part projects in uh, Manchester Airport uh, uh, for a number of nodes and fixed links. Now, the big learning curve for us here is that we're used to designing for contractors uh, to take thousands of small parts to site. And e even where we're that uh, content is coming from off-site manufactured elements, we're still taking lots of small pieces. Now, with some of the kits of parts we're doing, the shift is that we now want to take a very small number of large components to site and put them together much faster. So that's the trend that we see taking lots of uh, big things to site and putting them differently. And the final couple of points is really around the, the shift of uh, and how we use data. So, and, and again, previous speakers have spoken about the importance of rehearsing, doing digital rehearsals and what we do through 4D modeling. But we're also seeing the bridging into lots of other data sets. So for us, uh, trying to connect all the disparate data sources in the design process becomes important. So, so just now, whether it's CFD analysis or fire, or any of the other parts of the design process. These are all, uh, let's say, silos uh, of separate data. Uh, and ultimately, as we move to digital twins and smart building technologies, again, creating silos of, of data. But the ability to really start to shift between those data sets and then connect all these data uh, sets is, is where we see the future, is that ability to use data in real time. And, and for example, uh, the idea of designing a facade system as an architect and having real-time data on energy use so that I can see how that design is working from an environmental perspective as I'm actually, if you like, adjusting the, the, the design of what we do. So, so that's very much how we see the future and data valves that control and record the data that flows between different entities. 
But the final piece that I want to talk about, and, I, and this is really back to this whole point about the paradigm shift that we're about to see. Uh, we, 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 we're hearing a lot nowadays about the role of AI in the future. And what we have to remind ourselves is that the design process that we worked to just now is still fundamentally driven from the knowledge that resides in our mind. So imagine how powerful the construction industry would be if we could connect all the knowledge that is currently in our brain. So a lot of what we're doing is thinking about the future and what's the role of the human in the future of how we design buildings. And certainly AI as a technology is going to transform what we do and it's really going to make us think about how we make decisions. I think on projects we were very poor at recording decisions and we are certainly very poor at then going back to that same decision on the next project and making it again. So uh, we keep making the same decisions again and again. So we, we're currently working on this, a decision engine that might actually help to shift that uh, towards a new paradigm. So lots of themes there. I'm quite happy to take any questions on that. So that's some of our own observations of what we see out there. A huge shift away from construction to uh, manufacturing, but it will take time to do that. And tools like AI really transforming the design process. But we certainly see a really exciting future where AI uh, creates the time for us to do things differently. So thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much, Dale. Um, so it's now time for um, us to discuss some of the points raised. But critically, for you, the audience, to put your questions to the panel. So if you want to put a question to the panel, please do so now on the interactive facility and we'll endeavour to take as many as these as we can. Um, while we're waiting for some questions to filter through, just, just um, one or two things I wanted to raise. Um, you touched on this, Dale, um, yeah. the role of digital twins and also net zero. And when we think about the sort of net zero targets and really the increasing focus on in-use performance, um, you know, new, new certification yeah. systems like Neighbours, which require ongoing monitoring of buildings. Yeah. I mean, is there a disconnect between the build side of digital um, and the operational side, are, are these coming together? I'm interested to get really all the panel's views on how this is um, developing. I think there's different t trends there, Thomas. I think we're, we're definitely seeing that connection uh, occurring and we're seeing more uh, digital twins taking place. I, I think there's a lot of noise out there about digital twins and 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 certainly it was Rolls Royce and you know that their shift from selling engines to selling power by the hour that was one of the catalysts for the shift to digital twins and I think it, I think that's what really excites us about how that operational data can actually drive a reduction in operational carbon so we're, we're seeing a lot there but but there for a lot of projects there, there is still a huge disconnect between the operational phase and, and the capex phase but certainly in, I mean we've been doing some work with some of Paul's team recently, for example, looking at uh, the, the data classification and the data that we add into our models during the, the, the design phase to, to help to mobilize uh, that post occupancy kind of value from, from all the data that we're creating as we design. So it, it's still not there yet, but certainly that's a huge shift that we see in the future. I see. And I mean, with, I mean, the idea of sort of, um, you know, real live data and pulling all that together, data together into a digital twin. Yeah. I mean, you're, obviously you can do that as WSP, but you know, if you're working as part of a wider supply chain, how do you ensure that the whole supply chain is feeding in data that can be used by these tools? Yeah, so, so in the last 10 years, I think we've made a huge, uh, well, massive progress in the geometry that's in our models. Uh, I think we're really just, dipping our toes into the metadata side of it. Uh, we certainly do see a lot of uh, data put into models, but uh, I think it sometimes could be better structured and, and better classified. And, and I think that's some of the, the work that we've got to do in the next two or three years, Thomas, to, to really provide the solid foundations for AI technologies in the future. And Paul, what's your experience of this? Yeah, I, like, I think I'd echo I'd echo everything that Dale said there. I, I'm from a defence and aerospace background myself, and you know, if you look at the power that, that 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 having that kind of true digital twin has yielded in the aerospace industry, um, it, it's incredible. But it comes at a cost. You know, there's there's a level of investment that is required really upfront to define that metadata that Dale mentioned that you need to collect. 
to to truly capture it and you know and scrub it and make sure it's clean but also really begin with the end in mind you know the, the we need the we need the operators to be thinking very hard around well, what is it that they want to be doing with this data because you need to think about the outputs that you want to then define the inputs otherwise the risk is we collect loads and loads of data that doesn't get used you know one two five years down the line but we haven't got that critical data that we really did need so but I think, yeah, I, I think it's, it, 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 over the next five, 10 years, it will be a huge area of development and it will make a massive difference to the, to the built environment. Um, I actually think our, you know, our clients and our operators have got quite a key role to play in there. But yeah, you know, I think, you know, the likes of all of the organizations represented on the call would be really interested to, you know, to work with them to understand what the art of the possible is. Thank you. And, and maybe, do you, I mean, do you have a sort of operational feedback loop at all in the projects that you do? Yeah, we tend to because we're often doing a turnkey project. So we're there right through to the end. You know, the four expo pavilions we're doing will also have um, a role throughout the expo and then we will come in and remove them as well. So that whole thing, you know, our, we're really being held to account throughout that process. We get approached on Digital Twins, we get approached by quite a few companies in kind of the sports venue space who are really acting from that client perspective. And, and Paul will know this from Everton, where they're saying, well, you know, this is how you can map your sight lines and this is how you can sell your hospitality boxes and here's the user experience, which is, is quite good for, um, can be good for operational teams, client side. But what we sometimes struggle with, and we can work with that for sure, because we're, we're you know, sight lines, wide spans, all of those things, the broadcast facilities, like, you know, we live and breathe that stuff. Where we sometimes struggle is those systems are competing with what architects want to use and want to do. And we always work with external architects. So we're kind of, it's a coming together of that design phase and that operational user phase. And we sometimes find ourselves stuck in the middle wanting to get decisions made quickly by the client. And I think Dale was saying this, this can slow down decision-making because operational teams are given too many options for what they can do. But then a bit of resistance from architects who want to take that pro, that pro, that design all the way through to say stage four. If the modular contractor isn't bought in early enough, they will specify the wrong system. And then we're not having those user experience conversations early enough in the process. So you've kind of got a different maturity of the different approaches. And when it comes together, it's brilliant. And I would say a project like ABBA, it comes together, particularly if you've got a very strong client with a very strong vision for that technology. And then we're all building that house to host the show other projects like an Olympics or, or a kind of multi-user venue, it, it can be really challenging. And I, you know, we, we're always looking for new architects who want to work with us on, a, you know, at the start with the, with the MMC contractor so we can really learn from each other and help the client and help the operational teams understand. Thank you. We've got a question. I mean, Dale touched upon artificial intelligence. We've actually got a question as well um, from one of our um, audience about AI. Um, and the question is actually how far away do you think AI is from being able to produce a detailed design? That's Reba Stage 4. Um, I'm interested to hear your views on that, but also um, it, more generally to really see how AI is actually helping um, the industry deliver better projects more effectively now and the trajectory perhaps going forward yeah i can pick that up first thomas so so we what we're seeing and and i was at a, a session at the riba on last week on ai uh is that there's lots of optimization of what are, we do in our own professions using ai so we're seeing lots of uh, individual use cases uh, I, I think that it's going to be another couple of years. And, and, and I think, again, everyone's spoken about we need to get better data into our model. We need to get better classification. There's a lot of heavy lifting that needs to get done before we can really power up AI solutions that work at a whole project level. So, And, and I, I think it's by the end of the decade before that might work. But uh, I, I think the really important thing is is not to to think about well can I produce my stage four design in 15 minutes you know from from start 
uh, I think that kind of misses the point because I think the human will always have a role in the future. And I think we will always be able to, to do more projects I think, using AI. But I, I think the important thing is, is to figure out, well, what is it? We, where, where do we think we're driving waste? There, there are so many tasks that we do in projects that, that are not adding value to the process that we should just be you know, saying, well, let's bank that. And on the next project, let's not make that decision again. So I think we, we need to use AI to, to resolve the challenges of the future, such as decarbonizing of buildings uh, or just creating buildings that create better outcomes. Uh, I had a discussion yesterday, actually, uh, with a neuroscientist, and, and, and I think that's some of the new sciences that we'll see coming to our industry to drive better user outcomes for buildings. So I think AI will, will do help us bring new sciences into the art of designing buildings. Um, so I'm, I don't know if that will necessarily be quicker, but we'll certainly be able to drive better outcomes in the future using AI. Thank you. Uh, and, and Paul, I mean, are you using AI processes at all in any way? And how do you see it sort of, you know, hopping like a raw in the future? Yeah, I, I, I'm going to be a little bit mischievous with with AI. I, I think if if I was to draw a comparison to um, to navigation, so you know, roll the clock back 20 years, and we would have all had those big A3 atlases on the back shelf of the car, and then Via Michelin came along and started to tell us our route, but we had to print it off. Now you can go on and, uh, you know, and Waze can tell you where you need to do and, and correct your route to make it, make it the fastest route there and tell you when there's a speed camera. And then if you're lucky enough to own a Tesla and you pay for the expensive module, it can actually self-drive you. So, so there's, like a, there's a journey of evolution here. And I, and I think AI is really exciting, but I think that's, the, the, yeah, that's, that's where we're all heading. I don't really think we're there yet. I think a lot of what we see, certainly in construction, but other sectors as well, is I, I call it IA, intelligent automation, and uh, I, th I think I think Dale touched it there. There's a huge amount of time that we can free up from, from colleagues, and not only do you free up time from you know from very manual processes, um, it, you know you, it's, you can have it based on rule sets. So you know from a design perspective, we are playing around with some some tools that can help us iterate our designs. It means that you're generating designs not just quickly, but that are totally compliant with whatever the regulations and the requirements are. You know, builders' work, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, so, so we definitely see a see a role. Um, I, I, most most AI technologies that that, that that come across my desk, you don't have to scratch that hard to find that it's not really AI just yet. There's some great, you know, there's some great technology in there. There's some great machine learning going on. And I'm not dismissing them out of hand, but I just want to be realistic. You know, I think I think I, I agree with with Dale's timescales there. We're a couple of years away, but but hey, you know, this is this is the future, and it will make a huge difference. So we're all up for it. <laughs> and Amy, I mean, are you dabbling of AI at all in your um, world? <clears throat> um, not really. We've got a lot of um, clients that we that that use use this te technology. And we're providing that platform, whether it's a stage or a, a venue. Um, I think I kind of reflecting on what Dale was saying, I think there are some really unsexy uses for AI, which we all desperately need. And I mean, for us, we, we've created a, as an SME, we've got our own professional planning team that, we, that was new and new in the event, event suppliers industry. And it's worth its absolute weight in gold and we are rescheduling and replanning with our client teams all the time on these fast track projects you could see huge potential for ai to kind of revolutionize that part of our data and decision making journey journey i mean it is coming in on these kind of user experience and there's lots of digital mapping for the more complex um, buildings we're we're doing but that's been driven by you know enlightened kind of des designers more than anything we're waiting for that platform that dfma platform that means we can um, we can integrate all of our systems and processes so if anybody's got one you know, do, let, do let us know <laughs> uh, uh, thomas if I, if I can just um kind of build on amy's comments there i think um a massive part of of success here is going to be around trust so you know these the, the, some of the AI tools out there they they can feel a bit like a black box and you know they spit out that the answer is seven, 
and we're all healthy skeptics so we we want a level of uh, understanding and assurance as to where that number's come from you know yeah, hopefully the answer is seven um dale touched on it that, you know there's there's so much that's in our brains that we've actually got uh, we've got a real um requirement to to i guess document and capture all of that knowledge and feed it into the ai engines um because you know it, it needs stuff to be able to build on and and and, and work with so that's going to be important and I, I guess building on that, the, um, you, you, I don't think the right way to do it is to is to build an AI. You know, it, you don't take a process and AI it. You need to fundamentally go back to the drawing board and go and think about the outcome that you're aiming for and redesign your process with AI in mind. You can automate the process that you've got today, but if you're really going to exploit the potential that AI offers. You need to kind of go back and really, you know, take the take the shackles off and think differently. Um, so some processes I, I would, be different. Yeah. yeah, I was going to say I would agree with that. And and if you think about as as contractors, the the contracts we work to and the commercial terms we work to, I think there's a general nervousness that AI is going to capture a number of data points and moments of time in a project, a project. that actually contravenes those contract agreements and if those contracts don't update to reflect on those emerging ai tools then you can see, you'll see a really entrenchment and actually you could see the industry regressing rather than progressing so i, th I, th I think there's a there's a there's, you know i would want my kind of commercial director in thinking about this from the perspective of what he's going to hold to account to make sure we get paid in our payment terms and we're able to pay our suppliers. Because if AI is used against us, and we've all been in those meetings where our minutes have been recorded without our consent on an AI tool, and then it infects the whole of your system. I think you know there, there's some really serious kind of governance issues that need to be looked into so that we do incrementally adopt those best practice and use it to kind of, to make contracting commercial arrangements slicker um, and more accountable but i think at the moment there's a bit of a risk there but, i mean the question here that sort of ties in with what you're saying actually is clients and their reluctance to embrace change in their approach to project delivery and the, the ways of doing that and obviously that could be mmc it could be digital technologies we're talking about but going back to your point just now amy the whole ia, IA picture so what i mean what can be done to influence mindsets to ensure that f1 is moving forward rather than some people holding other people back i think um, the, the main sorry paul uh, the main thing i think thomas is to just get a case study so if we can show people the art of the possible because I, I don't know a single client that we work with that doesn't want their buildings faster greener uh, and you know quick and and uh, all these other things safer so I, I think clients are looking for those outcomes to get cheaper buildings get quicker buildings and so on so i think we just need to get the case studies out there but but go back to the the start of my presentation we've got to remember that there is we're still fundamentally designing traditionally so it's it's fantastic to talk about uh ai and its future and so on but we still deliver thousands of drawings for every project that are dead data and are not necessarily adding value to the process so let's remind ourselves there, there's a long way to go yeah and Paul, did you say so you wanted to come in? <clears throat> yeah, I, 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 I'd love to encourage uh, you know our clients and 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 all of us, our supply chain, to you know to, to take that first step and to take a brave pill. You know, to, so often you have conversations where people are very happy to be second. <laughs> <laughs> so it takes it, you know, it's trying to find that that that, that one person that's going to em, that's going to embrace it first. And hey, look, some of the projects um, perhaps won't lend themselves to this, but other projects, you know, if you look at the at the volume of data centers that are coming along, you know, data centers are are you know typically you know, you've got an Amazon, you've got a Microsoft, you've got you know some of the you know microchip semiconductor factories that are coming in. These are companies that absolutely live and breathe innovation, technology, digital data. So maybe we have to, you know, we have to we have to pick our battles and go and find the right place to land it. You know, we're very fortunate to be working with a couple of um, kind of American tech tech giants at the moment, um, and and they are the projects where they're really excited to embrace you know different ways, modern ways of working and new technologies. Um, so yeah, I, th I think that's what we have to do. You know, pick the pick the right areas.
And, and Paul, I mean, it's interesting you mentioned those, those, those big American tech companies. I mean, are they, are they actually sort of helping you? I mean, they're saying, look, we've got this technology that you could use to deliver the building, sort of better buildings. Are they doing that or are they sort of letting you sort of, they're just embracing innovation, but the innovation comes from you? Yeah, so 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 I think the innovation is probably coming more from more from us at this point. Um, I know a couple of the suppliers that we're working with, um, uh, the technology providers here in the UK, they're working with big American companies, and actually they've had seed funding from those companies because they've said, look, you know, you are absolutely vital to us being able to deliver this kit, you know, the, the, these these schemes in the timescales required. Um, so they've. Um, yeah, they've they, they've actually lent in and offered some some funding there. So again, they're not giving them a solution, but they are supporting them on that journey. Like I said, I, th I think we've got to pick the right clients where these things are going to land successfully. Thank you. And um, Amy, any final words from you about the um, client side and, and um, improvement? I I I think we we've got to hit the um, specifiers and the cost consultants as well. Because some of the breaks on some of this innovation and uh, progression are kind of who the clients are bringing in, particularly on the public sector side, to ad to advise them. And actually, if they are commissioned in a progressive way, then you can you can really move a lot faster and ad adopt new processes and adopt this collaborative approach that we're all talking about. When you've got cost consultants or other consultants client side actually slowing down the process and that's their aim to make sure that every kind of cross is ticked and and you know that's that's not going to drive innovation i think we've got a really clear client the ones i've i've mentioned paul's mentioned who's actually driving that specification then everyone's moving towards the, the same goal so I, I think we've got to hit the, the people who are providing the standards and also some of those advisors as well great well thank you very much um, believe it or not we're actually out of time um, we've been online for an hour um, so uh, let's say thanks very much indeed for your presentations and insights it's been really interesting and it's going to continue to be a fascinating area to follow. Um, for, for our audience, thank you for listening. And to, just to say that the presentations will be available to download at some point. And also, I'd like to encourage you to fill in a survey, um, to say what you thought about this session, what you think could be improved, but also to say, see, ask you what you would like to see us focus in on in the future. So if you could just take a minute or two to fill that in, that would be greatly appreciated. Um, so that's all. And thank you very much, everybody. And have a good rest of the day. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye.